Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to introduce our seminar on science diplomacy and climate change. We are going to have a conversation with our two guests. I hope to pronounce it correctly. Oystein Janssen Sorry. and Hart Buchauk, uh, both ERC grantees, as well as contributors to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For our listeners and viewers, uh, you are most welcome to ask questions on Twitter, and depending on time, we'll try to pick up one or two that our guest can reply. So if that's okay, can we start with, uh, with you, Oistin? Uh, you also serve in the Scientific Council of the European Research Council, so thanks also for that, and your work on the Arctic. The Arctic, as we all know, is becoming quite hot, in the dual sense of the melting ice at uh, scaring speed and of the geopolitical stakes in the region. How do you see the developments in the Arctic? Well, uh, first you're correct that it, it is a hot spot in terms of climate change. On average, the Arctic is heating twice as fast as the, uh, the rest of the world and some areas five to 10 times faster. Um, and that's because uh, of the reducing sea ice cover in the Arctic. So the Arctic is usually white, but it's becoming less and less white. And that's why it's heating up uh, more fast, because white surfaces reflect sunlight. And when it disappears, then more of the sunlight is absorbed. So you have a amplified warming in the Arctic. Uh, there are other reasons. Um, the uh, glaciers are melting and uh, particularly the uh, Greenland ice sheet is melting. And the Greenland ice sheet is now the single most uh, uh, significant contributor to ongoing uh, sea level rise globally, uh, so, which means that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The effects of changes in the Arctic will be felt, particularly in the low latitudes. So, so sea level rise is, is, of course, a concern of millions of people or billions of people around the world, um, lots of mega cities, for instance. So, so, um, so that's uh, one aspect. And the other aspect is when the sea ice disappears, you also open up the Arctic for other types of, uh, of uh, uh, exploitation and transport. So there is a drive to, to, to uh, open up more regular transport routes between Asia and Europe maybe also the east coast of North America through the Arctic, at least uh, some parts of the year. Uh, uh, and also there are lots of uh, resources that may be easily uh, found. Uh, some of them are problematic climatically, like uh, fossil fuel resources, but also other resources in, in, the, in the Siberia and Northern Russia that can easily be, or easily be, uh, transported out of the region uh, if, if if the when the sea ice is is disappearing, so so that's one reason. And the third thing in the Arctic is that there is there is more uh, cold war like tension militarily uh, because of uh, uh, there is there is a more uh, more visible Russian military presence than used to be in the post-Cold War uh, era. So, so that's also uh, that's a geopolitical interest. And you see that also in the, in the Arctic Council. There's much more interest in the Arctic outside of the eight member, member states of the uh, Arctic Council, the, the primary Arctic countries. Uh, that is... Um, uh, so there are lots of observers to the Arctic Council in in uh, non-Arctic countries, particularly Asian countries, and that also uh, is showing that there is an at least an awareness that there are opportunities that countries with some global ambition uh, uh, needs to be aware of, and uh, the Chinese is is opening a. Uh, what they call the, the Arctic Silk Road, mm -hmm. uh, this road and Belt and Road policy of, of, of the Chinese, and that's 
uh, an aspect of, of, of primarily I think it's driven from from uh, economical uh, well, economical reasons but of course uh, economy and politics and potential military tension is, is then of course bound together so that's that's uh, the situation as it is now it's lots of things are changing but we should also be aware that there are lots of aspects of the Arctic climate that are unknown uh, we know it's changing fast but it's it's also uh, uh, open for surprises because we don't know that much of the Arctic Ocean its circulation uh, so the rapidity of change can uh, can change and of course uh, there are aspects of the Arctic that we can consider as tipping point, important tipping points, which underlie the, the um, climate agenda. And um, in my opinion, uh, we probably will pass the tipping point in terms of, of uh, the green and ice sheet around now. Uh, so, so even if we succeed to reach the, the Paris Agreement, we are bound to have very significant sea level rise, with, even with the climate we have today. Thank you, Ustin. Uh, unfortunately, the breaking news are bad ones about the uh, important tipping point, and uh, you actually anticipated uh, what we will discuss also later on uh, some contributions to you know, the geopolitical aspects uh, from a scientific point of view. But let's now turn to Halvard. Um, you are a leading scholar in peace research, and several studies, including by yourself, um, indicate that climate change uh, is maybe not an important cause by itself as of armed conflict, uh, but it's increasingly seen as a risk multiplier. And uh, this is actually something also acknowledged by the EU security strategy. Um, can you tell uh, more about how you see the key links between climate change and conflict uh, that you see at work? And do you think there are some regions especially vulnerable? Actually, Usten was telling us about certain vulnerability that he can see from the point of view of what happens in the Arctic. So not only the Arctic is vulnerable from point, that point of view, but this doesn't necessarily mean then be vulnerable also to increased conflict. So. Mm -hmm. What you can tell us. Thanks. Um, it is true that uh, the evidence is weak for a causal link between climatic factors or climatic extremes and the outbreak of armed conflict. Um, there is actually more uh, consistent evidence, and we might even say converging evidence, um, that climatic conditions or anomalies can contribute to making conflicts worse by prolonging conflicts and um, making them harder to end. Um, however, the main reason why climate change is often framed uh, as or described as a risk multiplier is through likely indirect effects. So while climatic factors such as droughts or heat waves or floods or other extremes uh, by themselves uh, do not systematically and significantly increase conflict risk. Uh, we know that many of these extremes can have adverse impacts on important causes of conflict. So what causes armed conflict today? Well, this is a complex phenomenon, uh, but we know that countries that are described or shaped by extreme poverty, extreme inequality, um, economic inequality between social groups, uh, political discrimination um, among social groups. Uh, these are some of the uh, most important drivers of conflict today. And several of these factors, especially the economic aspects of society, uh, is often quite vulnerable to climate change and climatic extremes. Um, where do we see this link materializing or where do we think that climate security is more relevant as a topic? Um, I think it's very easy to, to, to think of Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Uh, much of the contemporary research on climate conflict connection uh, focuses on Sub-Saharan Africa or parts of that uh, uh, region, and for good reasons. This is uh, an area or a region uh, where we have some of the most vulnerable societies to uh, climate change. 
Uh, and this is also a region with uh, a number of ongoing uh, conflicts and also with a history of violent conflict, uh, meaning that they are vulnerable or, or um, of experiencing new conflict. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is still predominantly rural, uh, meaning that the majority of the population still relies largely on rain-fed agriculture. Now, if the drought strikes or if the rainy season is delayed, uh, that can have dramatic negative impacts on large number of people, on their livelihoods, on their income levels. And if their average income levels to begin with uh, are quite low, it also means that the um, uh, the income or the, the, the cost of foregoing normal economic activity and taking part in violent activity is much lower. And so in that sense, uh, you might say, or many scholars argue that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is one so-called hotspot of climate conflict connections. Um, thinking into the future, however, I think we also need to uh, broaden our scope a little bit. Um, Ersan Janssen already uh, talked a bit about sea level rise. It's clear that uh, highly or densely populated coastal low-lying lying areas uh, are increasingly exposed uh, to sea level rise. Um, and at some point, we may have a large number of people having to uh, relocate. Now, that migration could potentially cause friction between hosts and newcomers. Uh, whether that will result in armed conflicts and wars, uh, the way we know them today, is less clear. But it is clear, uh, increasingly clear, that climate change has an increasing potential for causing human insecurity uh, and reducing welfare in vulnerable countries. Thank you very much, uh, Halvard. Uh, and again, uh, the hotspot uh, metaphor uh, is uh, helping us somehow to see where certain you know, critical areas are and uh, also how resilience can be uh, you know, built or be more difficult. Now, let's make explicit then the link between your work as scientist and science diplomacy. Uh, the Intergovernment Panel, Panel of Climate Change um, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, so congratulations to both of you as contributors to the IPCC and as recipients of the Nobel Prize. Now, do you think as scientists uh, you can contribute to cooperation across borders, either when traditional diplomacy fails or as support and contributors to diplomacy? We just had the unfortunate situation at the Conference of the Parties to the Framework Convention of Climate Change in Madrid, not leading to a great solution, somebody can say a failure. So what would be your take on this point? Well, I think the, the main aspect of science, that particularly natural science, is to provide the evidence needed and so that all stakeholders being governments or others have access to the correct information about what what is happening with, with the climate and for many years i think we as natural scientists thought that well just lay out the facts and things will happen and we've seen that that's not the case and and this linear model of of how decisions are made doesn't work so i think um there, there is then a, a, the, the, what we can achieve uh, is limited because there are, it has to be solved uh, by the society, by on the political level, and uh, and that is driven by other aspects than just the fact and evidence. So, so, uh, so in that sense, it's it what my profession can do. And I think Halva's profession is more in line with what is really needed. Uh, it's it's most, most for the social scientists to, to develop uh, uh, that aspect. But I think it's still important to, to, to uh, make sure that we have the evidence so that the effects of climate change are laid out clearly. And I think uh, um, uh, with Greta Thunberg, who says, uh, uh, listen to the scientists and take science uh, and use science as a guiding principle. I think there are some good hope that that's maybe coming back a little bit. But I think um, uh, 
the role of scientists should remain uh, as scientists and not not um, activists in that sense. But of course, we we can formulate the the the, the answers more clearly, and of course. Uh, so, 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 so the science informing policy. I think that's still the, the main thing. But of course, in some areas, scientific collaboration between uh, countries, uh, multinational, big multinational uh, scientific expeditions, and and activities, uh, which is often seen in the Arctic, has a means of of creating less tension between nations where there is maybe some tension. And I think uh, uh, scientists can also serve as as a role model for how you collaborate to achieve a common good. So 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 that aspect, I don't think we should underestimate uh, that because that uh, that science is funded by the governments, and the governments uh, are behind that type of collaboration. And hopefully, that can serve as a model for how you solve uh, questions and issues. Actually, that's a brilliant idea about you know, the bottom-up and top-down aspects of science diplomacy. I mean, science, scientists have been always cooperating across borders, even mm -hmm. when other people don't speak with each other, including yeah. during the Cold War. But at the same time, if there are national scientific programs suggesting we should cooperate, for example, like in the Arctic, mm -hmm. this is a nice combination. Thank you. Halvard, what is your take on the point? Um, I very much agree with what uh, we have heard so far. Um, Actually, I would say that uh, the work of the IPCC over the past three decade, uh, decades uh, has been quite successful, actually. Uh, and a major reason for that success in terms of informing decision makers, informing the general public about climate change and the fact that uh, human made uh, emissions are driving climate change is precisely uh, international collaboration among scientists. I do not think that the IPCC would have nearly had nearly the same influence on thinking, on awareness today, if it had been uh, uh, an exclusive club of scientists uh, from top universities in Europe and North America. And so that really broad representation of scientists from across the globe is a major reason for why the IPCC has achieved uh, what it already has achieved. Now, of course, looking back at the last COP meeting, you might say that there's still uh, uh, far from success in terms of action. Um, and yes, that, that is <laughs> obviously uh, very true, and it's a, a source of big frustration. Uh, now, I think there are many reasons why we still uh, see a failure to properly uh, um, uh, uh, see changes. Uh, uh, Ostan mentioned uh, some of those reasons. Um, I would just like to add very briefly uh, a couple of other observations. Um, Policymakers are short-sighted. Uh, they think until the next election and what can make me or my political party survive at the next political uh, uh, election, right? Um, and so this short-sightedness of uh, politics in most countries is counter to this long-term thinking uh, 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 of uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change, which uh, requires costs today that will eventually be smaller than future costs uh, if we do do nothing today. Uh, so um, one way to try to change that uh, uh, way of thinking is to working with uh, the media, working with the general public and making uh, a, a, a public push towards change. Because if that is seen as necessary or an important strategy for also winning the next election, then I think we can see change. Thank you very much, uh, Harold. So, Einstein was actually somehow uh, challenging social sciences and humanities to try to find some solution mm -hmm. to those aspects, how we can actually impress the importance of taking care now of long-term mm -hmm. issues uh, addressed uh, by impacts of climate change. I don't know whether there are questions that came through Twitter. No, there aren't. Well, in this case, I think we are perfectly on time to uh, thank our guests for being with us um, and to uh, anyone who is interested in pursuing further the conversation and uh, the 
and hearing more about uh, uh, the work of uh, Einstein and uh, Halvard, but also of the other speakers we are going to have uh, shortly starting at 11. Uh, you can follow our uh, science diplomacy seminar jointly organized by the European Research Council and the research executive agencies at http https double slash webcast at ec at europa at eu joint uh, little dot rca rare seminar science diplomacy anyhow you have everything written on so you better check that one and click the link rather than trying to type based on my bad pronunciation um by the way i saw the slides you prepared i stand on uh, you know this the evolution of uh, of uh, climate change uh, impacts and the rise in temperature and mm -hmm. uh, well it's quite shocking and I think this is one of the areas where surely natural sciences and social sciences can cooperate extremely well also with media and the public and policymakers. We have to hope that there are some who can take into account the long term perspective and I would hope the European Union with its Green Deal is partly also responding to that need, but surely research has a lot of contributions to make and we will discuss that further in our seminar starting at 11. Thank you again to our guest. Thanks to the colleagues who have been working hard to organize this. And thanks to our viewers and listeners. Goodbye. <laughs>